gentleman by the name of Dick Salinas, who went to Mexico, and he saw the festivities that were going on all about this. And he said, hmm, why don't we do this in Fort Worth? He came back, got his family together, and started the, in 1965 the September 16th celebration. And it's gone on every year. It's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Mr. Salinas has died. His sister, Juanita Salinas, has taken it over. And now she's partnering with Tony Vasquez, who is the owner of Tejano Gold Radio, which is another show. But they continue this heritage of celebration. So Jim Lane decided that we need to again recognize our basically cowboy heritage. So he started the cattle drive, the, I guess, the replica of the cattle drive of the Chisholm Trail. But he, what he said is that if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. We're going to have those drovers reflect all the ethnic groups that were part of that Chisholm Trail. Unlike what we see in Hollywood, they weren't all looking like John Wayne. <laughs> they had Latino vaqueros, they had African American vaqueros, they had vaqueras, females. They just had different variety of individuals who were driving those cattle. So, part of the, if you ever see that cattle drive, you will see the reflection of the actual vaqueros or cowboys that did this. And so here's two that are participating in that. And then we have, I just want to point this out because this guy really wants to be in the parade. <laughs> he wants to walk his dog. And we have this little young lady who wants to be part of it as well. So she's on a burro with uh, dressed up as a charra. And that's, that's part of it. And by the way, I want to point out the collection again. This comes out of the Delsa Perez. Uh, Delsa couldn't make it tonight, today. I wish she would have because she's another historian that I stole this from her. No, I didn't. I asked her today. <laughs> so what, what kind of statistics? We have back in 1880, there was a census, 14. These are the individuals that they said were Hispanic heritage living in Fort Worth. Laborers, they were generally single, except this individual was married. And you can see that with their, their heritage of their father, mostly Mexican. There was one who was French, who had a French mother. But look at their jobs. Laborers, cooks, herders, laborers, harvesting, <coughs> harvesting. So they were basically country folks coming from Mexico, wanting to get jobs, and found work here. In 1880, there were 14. Let us fast forward. We're in a time machine. Now, 1970 to 2010. Remember 14? Back in 1880? Look what's happened within the last 30 years, 40 years. Currently, or the last census is 2010, right? Next one's 2020, in about three years. 252,000. African Americans, 140. Anglos, 1309. But look at the percentage change. Whites at 70 or 71, they are now 41%. This is Fort Worth. Hispanics were 7%, they are now 34%. And growing. We're all waiting with bated breath to see what that 2010 census, but I bet you it's gonna look like 50 plus percent the Latinos have in population in Fort Worth and growing and growing. Tarrant County, based on some community surveys that I saw, is currently 50% Anglo, and that's going to be by 20. So the future, from a demographic standpoint, is one in which, remember, this was all part of Mexico? <laughs> 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 some people get political now with this, and they say, well, you're advocating reconquista. The reconquista <laughs> means the reconquering. No, no. And later on, you'll see some photos of individuals who served in this country bravely, who have sacrificed, including my father, who have served in the country, including me, who have served in the military, and say, the United States of America is my country. It is my country. I was born, where did she say? Chicago. <laughs> Go Chicago Cubs. I was born in <laughs> Chicago. I am third generation. I am an American. If people tell me, go back to Mexico, I say, that's impossible. <laughs> I'm not from Mexico. How can I go back? <laughs> I can't go back to a place I'm not from. Heritage, yes. History, yes. 
But my roots are planted in this country of the United States of America, as well as my children. And we're not going anywhere. We're here. You can't, can't get rid of me. But this is the future. Fort Worth. This is back at the turn of the century. L look at, could you believe that one time you could walk down Main Street in the middle of the road? <laughs> look, look at this, the passages. Where are those vehicles going, the buses? None. This is going from the TP, remember Texas and Pacific Station that used to be there? Looking down all the way to the, court, the county courthouse. You see that? The number of people you see there are probably the number of Mexicans that were here at that time. Just imagine that. These aren't the Mexicans, but, but it's just interesting the way they dress. No cars, saloons, but no cars. <laughs> <laughs> so where do the Mexicans live? When they first came, you remember uh, in the 1880s they were already here? This is what's considered Hell's Half Acre. I mean, you've had probably that discussion about Hell's Half Acre before. Saloons, bordellos, shoot them up, you know, the vaqueros, the the cowboys, the, after on that dusty trail, they got to loosen up because you know, they still had, they were only halfway through on that Chisholm Trail. They still had to go to Kansas. Oh my Lord, let's stretch our legs. So they get off and have a good time. Well, Latinos coming had to work. And they would work anywhere and do anything in order to make a living. Okay, so they were sweeping the, sweeping the floors, the saloons, flo floors, floors, cleaning the spittoons, cooking doing whatever labor they could do, and so they would establish themselves here in Hell's Half Acre. The number first barrio was right there. Second barrio is another one called the Siete, close to Hell's Half Acre, right? But there was also, in the olden days, there was a stockyard here, believe it or not, as well as the Union Station. Third barrio that was established was El Corte, El corte meaning the court, or courthouse. So you had a population here. The illustrious Luis Zapata, remember city council Luis Zapata? Was born in a house in El Corte. His family settled there. They were from Mexico, and they settled there, and he was born in a house in El Corte. And subsequently he lost his house when they uh, were building a Henderson Highway, his family lost that house. And he was not happy about that. As he grew older, he realized what had happened. They were displaced. And it's one of the reasons he decided to run for office, because he understood that politics, if you're going to influence your life, you really need to get into politics. And he did. He was motivated to do that with a vengeance. <laughs> he then went behind and became city first Latino city council member in the history of Fort Worth. Now, what I was going to do, well, you can't see it now. There are other, as I mentioned, I started earlier, and I'm sorry, we have some technical difficulty. There are other neighborhoods, the north side. This is Marine Park. What happened was people followed where the work was. Stockyards was booming, right? Armour and Swift moved in, looking for labor. Already they had, in, they had already were employing European immigrants, Czechs, Greeks, uh, Irish, the um, Spaniards even, they were, they were uneducated, low skilled, but they needed work. So they went to work at Armour and Swift. Well, Mexicans were no different, right? So they moved in and they started working at Armour and Swift. What happened though is that they were restricted on where they could live. The restriction was between Northside Drive and 23rd Street and east of Main. Main Street was a dividing line up until the 50s. You could not live, Mexicans were not allowed to live west of Main Street because that's where the whites lived. Although they worked together at uh, Swift and Armour. What kind of restriction are we talking about? I mean, just a, uh, an understood restriction or a... A physically enforced restriction that if they found you on that side of the street, they would enforce their displeasure of your presence on that side of the street. The um, Diamond Hill, for example, had a Diamond Hill <coughs> housing association or neighborhood association that formed, and in it they said, we will not rent or sell to Mexicans. 
So they would not, you could not buy a house. The lots on the east side were selling for $100 to $200. On the west side, they were selling from $1 to $3,000. So there was somewhat of an economic barrier as well. But there is somebody who broke that barrier, and we'll get to him in a minute. But they, even if you wanted to, so some of these kids had to go to J.P. Elder, which was on the west side. And there are stories where kids who were living on this side, on the east side, were having to go to school, and it was a gauntlet. <laughs> they would go to school, and they had to run home because the kids didn't like them. Because, again, the, verse, the formal and the informal was that you're not welcome on this side of town. And it was enforced. They wouldn't rent to you. They couldn't buy in there. And unless you had business in there, like you were a maid or you were a housekeeper or you were cleaning the lawn, you had no business in that side of town. And that's, that, was, that was true also, not only for the north side, although the north side is where it became the number one, number one neighborhood, number one barrio. It happened all over the city. They could not be, you could not get into certain areas. And it's also demonstrated by the fact that they would not serve you. If you went to the restaurants, they would not serve you. And I'm gonna get, you're going to see an example of that here in a moment. So there, were, there weren't really, uh, not until African Americans started to ascend, and then you started seeing really formal Jim Crow laws. Uh, there weren't really formal Jose Crow laws. <laughs> But what you did see is a understanding and an enforcement in practice, a de facto enforcement of discrimination and segregation that, that was in place. If you, were, if you were here living, you knew the rules. You just do not go in that part of town, and you stay on your side of town. That was reality. Now, I don't have the map, I'm afraid, but there are other places. For example, well, we'll talk about, oh, let me just go on and we'll, this is Marine Park. Eventually, they broke that barrier down. And they started moving in in droves. So here's Marine Park. And you can see Latinos there. And it's still they now have a swimming pool there. At, at a point, they had a swimming pool, but it was restricted. Only whites could go there. They had a boys club there on Ellis, Restrict, restricted. You could not, little boys from the west side could not go there if you tried you would not be permitted to get membership in the boys club. That was just the way it was, it was practiced back then. Uh, now, I drove around one time, I was on the north side, and look what I find. And for me, this was reflective. Of course, this is Christmas, right? No, it's Halloween. <laughs> we, we do celebrate Halloween, too. <laughs> so anyway, I was driving around, and I stopped, and I see this. And I said, I've got to take a picture of these folks. But to me, it was almost emblematic about the love that these parents have for their children. That they went to the extent of building a spook house in the backyard. Now, I don't know how safe it is to build a plastic <laughs> spook house, but they went ahead and built a spook house for their kids so they can go in and, and have a good time. This is on the north side. So it, it reflected for me, too, again, that they wanted to raise their families in a wholesome environment. They wanted the same thing that all Americans want, is they want to raise their families, want to have good income, get good medical care, and be good citizens of this country. Now what happens? Fast forward. I love this picture. There's another one here. One of the rules were that if you were Mexican-Americans, and the Mexican-Americans did this, it wasn't really somebody who told them, you better wear your Sunday best when you go downtown. No blue jeans, no shorts, no raggedy clothes, you put on your best. And so the women and men, when they would go downtown, would dress up. It was a big deal. This was like in the 40s. I, I kind of tell by the hairdo, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. These are real people who lived here in Fort Worth. This was downtown Fort Worth. Here's a gentleman who's walking with his wife. Look the way he, he wears a tie to go downtown. But you see, why were they doing that? They wanted to say that we are respectful people. You see, we, we know how to dress. We, we respect you. Please respect us. 
And one way of defending yourself from discrimination, prejudice, is dress for success. Wear that suit, wear that tie. So people don't automatically make a judgment about you just because you look, because of your heritage or whatever. So that's what they did. This was on San Jose Church. It's All Saints Church, which was the first church in the in, first Catholic church in Fort Worth, was St. Patrick. I believe it was 1892 when it was founded. Second church in Fort Worth was All Saints, which is located up there on, uh, on Alice. Well, it was a predominantly Central and Eastern European church at that particular time. It was established in 19, 1909. All right? A lot of Eastern Europeans. The Mexicans, remember, on the west side, All Saints is on the, excuse me, on the east side, All Saints is on the west side. They were allowing Mexicans, but it was in the back. They wouldn't let them in the main church, so they could go have a chapel behind the church, but the population kept growing. So they said, we're going to establish a mission on the east side, so you can go to your church. And your church was going to be called San Jose. So they went to San Jose. This is San Jose Church. And this happens to be, you can tell, the, the dress in the 20s. And this couple is still, well, they're not alive, but their children are still alive. That's them getting married. In 1926, at San Jose Church, which I believe was located on 14th Street in Commerce. Okay? Now, I want to show you a picture, which really, again, demonstrates to me what happens when Mexican immigrants come here. I mean, your first impression is that this lady, this little girl here, Maria, kind of had haunted eyes about her. Does she not? Looking out. This picture was taken in 1920. Florencio, Venecitas, and there were two other children that are not here. They had eight children, but there's only six reflected here. Young family in 1920. But you could tell that they come from a poverty background, laborer background. Keep your eyes on Maria. Maria, Florencio, Felicitas, this isn't a test, but just, just rem watch, <laughs> remember what they look like. Try to remember what they look like in your mind. Go back 19 years later. This is Maria. This is uh, the parents again. What happened in those 19 years? Well, they had already eight children. They they, so these are the eight children, but they weren't all in that original picture. But look at the dress. Look at the demeanor. Look, look at how they look. I mean, how they hold themselves. They're actually wearing ties. In 19 years, in other words, from 1920 to 1939, life changed for them. This is what happens. Mexicans come. They work very hard. They're poor, but they work very hard. They, want to they send their children to school. And it's a generational issue then. Their parents, even though they may not have an education, may only have second or third grade education, want their children to become educated so that they can become part of the American mainstream. In 19 years, look at the material level that they increased to, as well as the psychological advancement that happened during that time period. They become acculturated. They understood how it works. They understood the rules in 19 years. I, I just remember this young lady's haunting vision, remember? Look at her now. Beautiful girl, beautiful woman. We also brought, this is in, uh, by Meacham Field. They were milking cows. I mean, they just brought the old country ways of doing things. Again, this was... You remember Meacham back in those days, Bass that way was all prairie, right? I mean, it was not developed. They took advantage of it. Hey, we start doing our own cattle, we milk our own cows, we butcher our own cows, whatever, in order for us to survive. That's what they did. This picture I particularly like is because it demonstrates, again, the heritage. Oftentimes, there's a theory called the melting pot theory, where it says you give up your old world heritage and come over here to the uh, new spin and span American heritage. Um, again, we did not cross an ocean. We crossed a river, and the border didn't cross me. I mean, the, I didn't cross the border. The border crossed me. It's kind of reflective here because these folks still hold on to the heritage, especially the older woman here. You see her? Look at the, what we call, oh, I'm sorry. Look, look at the braids. The, these are the Mexican colors, by the way. 
And here's, I don't know if this is her sister or granddaughter, I'm not sure, or her daughter. But young boy here, don't you know he's being influenced by them? He's saying, what they're saying is, do not, hold, do not give up your heritage. You're in the United States. There is a belief that people are smart enough and resilient enough to have multiple cultures. That on one hand, you could be walking on the east side of Main Street, dealing with your Mexican culture, but if permitted, you can walk on the west side and start speaking English and going to schools and saluting the flag. There is, people are capable of having multiple cultures as well as being bilingual, trilingual, quadlingual. That is possibility. We bring our heritage. Dia de los Muertos, have you heard of that? It's a festival that continues to go on. As well, this is kind of obscure. It's a mariachi music. And this is an ofrenda. An ofrenda is an offering for the dead, for the Day of the Dead. When they come back, it's a belief. And that you put out the things that they remember so that it helps them come back. Because they're kind of lost. They're lost. And they will come back if you give them the breads, the drinks, the probilia. They will help them come back. So you reconnect with your loved ones. You don't forget them. And there's an actual public dis display. This happens every year at, at uh, the Artes de la Rosa. It used to be called Marine Theater. Every year they, they do this celebration. And speaking of Marine Theater, uh, back in Rosa, they, they're reconstructing it right here. Marine Theater was opened in 1920s. And I don't know if any of you went there back then, but they used to have, um, it was like stage, they had vaudeville, different you know, people would come and speak. And after a while, the Mexicans decided to move in and their, their uh, actors, I understand Cantinflas, who was a famous comedian, came. Other singers from Mexico came. And the people from the barrios all over the city would come and, and view them. But later on, it became a theater. And they would show old, Me they're not old, but Mexican movies from Mexico. And it was my, my wife, who was raised in this area, says, and a lot of folks probably in this room, would go to this theater on Saturday and Sunday to watch the, to watch the movies, the Mexican movies. They were, they were in Spanish. That was a real treat. Later on, this theater went, uh, was not, um, really didn't, nobody was keeping it up. And then Jim Lane, <laughs> with uh, Luis Zapata and others, went ahead and got funding from the city, and raised money, and restored the theater. And it became now Artes de la Rosa, and it is an active artistic center on the north side of Fort Worth that you all are invited to go. It's really put on very good shows. Both uh, they, they do some videos, but most of the time it's live theater or live performances they put on. So that um, I remember my wife's uncle, who recently passed away, was very proud of t to show us his, uh, his musical troupe where he was performing on stage. Before he died, he said, that's, that's me, that's me, as a young man. So this was an outlet, an artistic outlet for, for local Mexicans who still wanted to sing and dance. I mean, work, 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 work. Makes a dull boy, doesn't it? That's all you're doing. But they were artistic. They wanted to express that, that love of singing and dancing, and they did it through this outlet, as well as through the churches, and we'll see that. This picture, to me, reflects some of the the coming together of cultures. You've heard of Steve Murin, the, the mayor of mayor of North Fort Worth, right? Look at the hat. And look at his hat. Look at the boots. He will probably not admit it, but that's a vaquero influence, my friends. No, I'm a cowboy. I'm a cowboy. Well, really? I wonder where'd you get those boots? Where did they come from? And that hat, that sort of looks like a little bit like a sombrero to me. And that big old mustache. I don't know if you've ever seen the pictures of those uh, Mexicans from uh, the, 19, the 1900s, but they had one of those big old bigotes. <laughs> that's, that's where that comes from. And then you have Nicho Sainz. He's kind of a folk hero up on the north side. He's the father, the patriarch of, uh, of a band. And one other influence I want to show you here. See this guy with the, with the accordion? Where does that accordion come from? 
German. The Spaniards didn't bring the accordion over. They brought the guitar. But they didn't bring that accordion over. So what happens is when cultures meld, when they come together, when you live next to each other, work with one another, you start adapting. Boy, the Mexican, the Tejanos were listening to that German music down in Fredericksburg. And they say, boy, you know what? I like that polka. So guess what? We started polka. But we put it with a little Latino flair with it, you see. We put Spanish words to it, just like Americans adopted do si do, do si do, do si dos, do si do. We borrow. That's what happens when cultures mix. You borrow the best from one another, what you like. How many of you like enchiladas? <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> and there's uh, Nietzsche signs, on, and that's his son, uh, Leo signs. This is a day when the city of Fort Worth honored Nietzsche Sainz for being an artistic individual. Every year also during the Desi Says, during with the time Mike Moncrief was mayor, and they still do it, they have uh, celebrations downtown. And Mike Moncrief obviously looks enchanted with these little, little girls who are dressed up. Now, again, work, 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 work. Mexicans come to work, work, work. So we have Armour and Swift, right? up on the north side that was established. Chisholm Trail went away because they found out that they could be more economical by, by going ahead and slaughtering and packaging the cattle in one location. Instead of having them come all the way up to Kansas, Dodge City or wherever, we could do it in one place and save money and make money. So Armour and Swift from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Came down, and they not only here, but in Saint, East St. Louis and different places in the country, but they understood the, the economics. The cattle is right there in Texas. Hey, we could monopolize that area. So they opened up their, their packing places, Armour and Swift. Again, Eastern Europeans, the Mexicans living there, low, low, um, low skill jobs, slaughtering. Uh, they went ahead and mechanized it, just like Henry Ford did on the Model T's. They went ahead and mechanized this in assembly line fashion. So one of you would butcher, one of you would strip, so on and so on. One of you would carry it in, one of you would package it. You just had to learn that particular task. So that allowed a lot of the Mexicans to get a job and have their families. So this is what happened. So they were in droves to the extent that Northside became the largest body. Another area was TMP, the Texas and Pacific. You remember I said el, el TP? El TP means the area where you live close to the Texas and Pacific. Notice the, remember taxis? Well, here are the taxis. <laughs> so once you, once you landed here in Fort Worth, you just came outside and got a carriage ride. Take me to Texas Hotel, or take me wherever you want me to take. So we had this, this building eventually burned down, you know. But so, Mexicans, again, they're looking for laborers, so Mexicans took advantage of this and started working on the railroad by droves. They worked on the railroad. Mr. Diaz, again, I'm going to point him out, 101-year-old illustrious individual, worked on the railroad for about 37 years before he retired. People were born in freight cars. People lived in freight cars. Mexicans lived in freight cars. The children were born in freight cars in Fort Worth. That was survival. That's what you had to do in order to make it. Um, they also opened up the steel mills in Worth Heights. They called it La Fondición, the boundary. Bits. And so they started establishing a community there where people would live real close to the Fondicion Steel Mill, Texas Steel Mill, there on Hemp Hill. And they would go ahead and work there. I recently listened to an audio about somebody who used to work there. He said they would hire Mexicans. In fact, they like hiring Mexicans because they tend to be very compliant and they would work hard and they would not go on strike like others would go on strike. 
they're just grateful for the jobs. So what would happen is when they would go on strike, they hire more Mexicans because they would do the work. In speaking with a former employee, of, um, or hearing the audio of, of an employee, he said that what they would do is that uh, they would all work together, <coughs> but when it came to bathing, uh, washing after you've been working in this heat, um, they had separate bathing areas, one for African Americans, which he said was way down the hall, way, way, yeah, walk down, and then they had one for Anglos, which was upstairs, these were all men, uh, Anglos uh, bathed upstairs and the Mexicans were on the first floor. So even though they hustled and bustled, and this was dangerous work, working with that rebar, it's hot rebar, and they would get burned, they would burn themselves. Um, and, but then when they would wash after that before they went home. So what would men do? Well, there was a line of bars that were right outside. And the guys <laughs> get tired on Friday night. Hey, let's go take a few. So they go across the street. <coughs> Back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, it depended who you were on whether you went in through the front door or you came in the back door. And for African Americans, it was consistently through the back door and they would have to drink in a separate room. Now, some Mexicans were permitted to come in in some of the bars, but not all of them, just some. So the guys would wonder, Where's, where, are, where are our co-workers going? Where are they? And they would, why are they going through the back? That was the way it was back then. Those bars aren't there anymore. But <laughs> um, so we, they worked in different, and some, and to this day, this is the, the reality. We have a number of undocumented workers that come, and they take the hardest, the highest risk, and sometimes the lowest paid jobs that are around. I mean, you can make your own observations. When you see who's doing the construction work out, outside, hot, it could be over 100 degrees. Who's doing the roofing? Who's doing the construction? Who's doing that paving? It's the Mexican immigrants. They come in and they work, 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 and they bring their families. The way it works is that the singles, or even if you're married, you come first. The males, they land a job, then they bring the family, and then you start settling in. The children are then born, and in this country to this day, you could, if you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen, their children become American citizens immediately when they're born here. But there are a number that were born in Mexico and come over when they were very young, as Mr. Diaz did. He was born in Saltillo, came over in five months. He was not an American citizen. Salvador Espino, who just recently announced he was not going to be run for city council, had that same experience. He was born in Mexico. He didn't become a United States citizen until he was 18. So when he was going to school all this time, he was undocumented. That is not a secret, that's nothing to be ashamed about. He admits it, that that was the reality of how he made it. But like a lot of other people, he saw the American dream, so he became a scholarship boy. Valedictorian of Polytechnical High School, got a full-time scholar, full four-year scholarship to TCU, went on to SMU to become an attorney. Now owns his own business on the north side, went on to become a city council member. That's the American dream, that's how it works, hard work. So they take the lower end jobs, some of them become migrant workers, they went out throughout, throughout this whole region, migrant working, and some of the families get tired of being on the road, it's a big dislocation, a big interruption in your life, so you end up settling in on the cities. I've had a number of conversations with Mexican Americans who say, my mom decided that that was enough. She wanted me to quit getting in and out of school, in and out of school, and decided to settle down in one, one location. They signed up in Fort Worth. This happens to be uh, Delsa Perez, David Perez, and she's not here. That's her father. Uh, construction.